Hello everybody, I am Mike Levin from MikeLevinSEO.com and today I'm going to discuss what I've been doing for the last week and why. And I decided to give it the title, Getting Started with Python on the Raspberry Pi as a Server. And inside this headline are a few important pieces of information you should extract. The first is a place to run your programming code. The second is a language for the code. And then the third is a way of interacting with your hardware that cuts off most avenues of graphical game development that's not web-based and mobile app development and sort of forces you to do your interaction with your hardware either through a web browser or through a command line shell. So let's talk about the what's and the why's of this platform. And before I actually start listing the items oh, under what, I thought I'd give you a few of my criteria for the overall project. Uh, I decided you had to use tools, so I wanted to knit together a, a chain of totally awesome but few in number tools that together which co uh, constitute a few things. First, it's got to be your development platform. It's got to be the things you need to sit down and do your work. Second, it should be the publishing platform. It should be where you put things so that it can run as a web server and Google can pick it up and people can discover you and you can share links from. It's your publishing platform. But then the third, it's got to be a place from which automated and scheduled tasks can run. Things like crawlers and uh, monitors and all kinds of stuff that runs in a context outside the normal web server. So that's sort of what I was going for. And what kind of things did I choose? Well, first and most obviously is the Raspberry Pi itself. And I think I'll just list them and then I'll go on to the whys because it's not necessarily the clearest path. A lot of people might choose the cloud or even their laptop as a place to run their code initially. And I want to list these different things including Arch Linux, I did not choose the Debian deriv derivative Raspbian, which is the recommended one, uh, or any of the other uh, OS's that come with graphical user interfaces installed. Hey, I'm jumping ahead to why. I shouldn't be doing that. The third is PyGreen, probably the least heard of of all my tool decisions. That sits on top of a bunch of things which are a little bit better known. The first one being Flask, which is a lightweight web publishing framework built on Python. The second is the Mako templates. And then finally are the two tools that I'm using all the time, which I use together whenever I say Python, which is implied in this list really, are my text editor Vim, so much more than a text editor, it plays the role of an IDE, but I jump ahead, and then the distributed version control system called Git. Okay, let's talk about the whys. First of all, let's just call it control. There are things you can do when you control your own hardware that you can't even do on the cloud. Things ranging from optimizing for the hardware that you're running on to breaking it out and using it in extremely different contexts like controlling physical devices in your environment. It's just better to have the hardware experience under your belt, and it's a great way to do it. It costs $35. The second is Arch Linux, and the reason for Arch Linux 
is it's a solid, stable version of Linux. It's great, but it does not come with a graphical desktop like GNOME or KDE pre-installed, which means that the main way to interact with it is through a terminal window, a shell, and that enforces this old school concept that I think is very important so that you don't go down the wrong path. I'm trying to expand many options here, but in other ways, when you put together a platform, you're also defining its restrictions and its limitations. Even if you use Raspbian as your Linux and you logged into it remotely, you always had the option of logging in through uh, VNC and getting a remote desktop and getting into those new and I believe sometimes bad habits of relying on the graphical user interface to control your server and your hardware. So the reason here is to force a sort of old school approach that's going to serve you well as computers, general computers, get built into more and more things uh, like, you know, forks and tennis rackets. And those aren't going to have desktops that you can log into. You're going to be able to interact with the Internet of Things uh, when you go with this approach. The next one is PyGreen. PyGreen sits on top of a few other components in order to give you a very PHP style of programming with Python. It's a missing piece in Python. It's a, Python's a great programming language for so many reasons and it almost should be on the list but many other videos explain why I think you have extreme power and capabilities in the future because of Python. So PyGreen gives you static HTML files, fast websites with a PHP style programming. So that's both fast web sites and PHP style uh, PHP style that's Pygrain. Now Flask is sort of interesting it's just got to be there but it take it is the web server it takes the place of Apache and Nginx, and that means that Python is your web server. And it's sort of the reason why Python isn't an item on the list here, because what it is, is it's an item here. Python, you get to do your website with all this incredible power and the routing system instead of files if you want. You can override all the behavior of Pygreen and go with this directly. And it's a very minimal uh, framework. It, it's not heavy with weight like Django or even Ruby on Rails or some of the other ones that are out there that put a lot of you know, features in but force you to work a certain way. It's, fewer restrictions and fewer files. Pygreen also makes available the Mako templates. Now it's already easy to do web style programming in Python because it gives you PHP style uh, you know, coding ability, but what Mako does is it determines all the rules of that environment and it lets you do fancier things than just include files for example you can put any python code in there but just as importantly you can use templates that have inheritance so if you've got a file that has things that would you know be broken out into header and footer and tracking code you can put it all in one file and then have all your other files inherit its structure from that master file and then you just selectively override where things are custom very powerful great way to organize a website and so i would call the mako templates giving you inheritance on your templates
complete inheritance. It's also behind Reddit and is, uh, although it's used with a different uh, framework, I think Pylon, but in any rate, it's, you know, really ready for prime time. It's good stuff. It's been around, serves billions of pages per month, that kind of thing. And then we move on to uh, the two tools here. These are mostly concerned with your web server environment, but this takes the place of your IDE, of your integrated development environment uh, for developing code, and there's not enough room here to list it. It's extremely old school. It has a steep learning curve, but it is incredibly powerful, and everything in tech comes down to controlling text files. And when you master Vim, you have ultimate control over text. And under ultimate, that's a grab bag of stuff because uh, that means timeless into the future, for example, right? Uh, it's not just a great text editor. A lot of people use things like Sublime these days, which is just a fine text editor, but is it going to be there forever? People who are on, you know, uh, text edit are already seeing what happens when developer support, you know, dries up. Does it necessarily stay in uh, the free and open source community? Does it get maintained and upgraded? You're forced off, there's relearning. You never have to relearn anything uh, forever into the future, and it's always going to be there. Similar with Git. There used to be a bunch of tools to keep your code safe called uh, SVN and, uh, you know, C CVS. Uh, but they have so many shortcomings and someone who had a big code maintenance problem, Linus Torvalds, who was using some proprietary software in the past, decided to just fundamentally fix this, develop Git, and it becomes a way to keep your code safe a way to get your code out into multiple places, a way for tons of people to collaborate, and you have an edit by edit history into the past, and it's even a way to deploy software on a relatively small scale. So this is, I guess it ties back to how much of this is about code. A place to run your code, a language of your code, and then this is code safety. There's nothing worse than working on something for years and then it all just going away because of a hard drive crash or something. So just a few more points that I make before I wrap it up. For that $35 of the Raspberry Pi here, you get something that gives you 24 by 7 availability, just like you know, getting one of these cloud servers, maybe even better than the free level of the Amazon Web Service cloud server, which you have to pay, begin paying for after a year, and they have their hand in your pocket and it'll start deducting from your credit card, even with the incredibly low usage. This you pay $35 once, and then it uses the broadband that you're already paying for, either at your house or your office, and all you got to do is resolve that static versus dynamic IP problem. I'm paying for a static IP but you could use DynDNS or one of the other ways to get a domain name of a web server to always point to your Raspberry Pi inside your network no matter how your dynamic IP changes so long as your firewall doesn't cut off incoming port 80 TCP IP requests or whatever other ports you're using. But you know, this, that'll be other videos for other applications. Point is, $35 and you forever forward have a place to run your code which because it's $35, you can get new ones, replicate your environment, distribute those copies of your environment to different locations, and essentially do all those same tricks of you know, uh, replication and distribution that makes the really high-end stuff that has to serve the world, uh, but you do it on a smaller scale and you learn all those same issues. And in the end, what all this amounts to is a viable platform for all your code endeavors that while looking like it's kind of small and crammed into a little piece, 
because you're learning a very formal way to do it in the industry, you could always move it off of Raspberry Pis onto uh, whatever you want from actual uh, big iron hardware like the big servers if you ever really build your own data centers, uh, you know, over to normal cloud instances. And uh, that is what I did over the past week. It's a much better starting point than I was at before last week where there would have been tremendous friction whenever starting a project. Where do I put it? How do I go about it? You know, where's the code going to execute? Uh, how long am I going to have it? Now all that friction has been eliminated and any new project I envision like this bookmarklet data collector or crawlers based on Scrapey or whatever it is, uh, I can just start putting it in location and turn it into new GitHub projects in an environment that you can reproduce really easily and follow along over the weeks and months and years as I develop MikeLevinSEO.com. Thanks for joining me and please share this video and don't forget to subscribe.